the goodness of God has definitely been, no, it caught me. It hasn't been running after me. I just thought we'd share a little bit of the good life that we've been spending. First slide up here. You didn't do them, Kirk? <laughs> oh, you did, okay. First one. Thanks, Jeff. So that was just off the patio in the beautiful condo we shared with our dear, delicious friends. We played games and shared deeply and walked on the beach and saw beautiful things. And that's the picture from the little teeny weeny place we stayed in Kauai, just me and Kirk. We'd been to Kauai oh, 20 times because that was the last place we were with our daughter Tara two weeks before she passed. And we were such a, it's such a place of spirituality. We would go back, but we always took a load of kids with us. And so sometimes we slept in the weirdest places, but it's always fun. And this was the first time we'd been by ourselves. And it was really special. And it's amazing. There are certain places in the world. I was talking to Mary about this in her places, Aspen and the mountains and all that. But you really feel that goodness of God and the deep, deep connection. And we got to be filled with that for two weeks. And it was beautiful. And I... I felt it here when I came into the goodness, the goodness right here of all of us together. So before I left, I have to pick out topics and titles. And so I saw a book online, which I hadn't, didn't know much about, and it was called The Good Life. And I thought, well, isn't that what we all want? Is there anybody here that does not want a good life? <laughs> OK, just checking. Because I thought, what a perfect thing to talk about, the good life. It's available, and there's a Harvard study that's the longest scientific study on happiness and the good life ever. It started in 1938, and it's been continuing, and it's followed generations and families about the good life. Well, I ordered the book, and it, it's, I didn't read it yet, but it will be a good book, I know. <laughs> but I, I looked at a few things about what creates a good life. If there was one thing right now for any of you, all of you, that you could just have right now that you think would create a better life for you, can you think what that might be? If you were 20, I would say it would be rich to be rich and famous. Because all, the, all of the young ones in the study, when they were young, wanted to be rich and famous. That would, what, is what would make their good life. Well, that's possible. Not guaranteed, for sure. But it changed. It changed in the study of what people called a good life. Now, to start the good life, um, what happens, or young people, I, I said that, what happens in our world today more than ever, it's always been a problem, but it's more than ever, we're bombarded with messages on how our life could be better. If we would change this, or take this, or go here, or do this, or be different, or something else, we could have a good life, a really good life. And then, on top of that, we scroll through social media. And of course, on social media, everybody puts their best, fantastic life, right? You don't report the things that are, take pictures of the things that are, well, blah. You just don't. <laughs> And so we get to look at all these fantasized versions of a good life. And you know what happens? We start comparing ourselves. How do we feel about all this perfection and goodness and happiness that's out there? There's an old saying that says, we are always comparing our insides, our feelings, to people's outsides, what we see. And so we get a very skewed vision of the goodness of life. We think, oh, wow, my life is way too complicated and messy to be a good life. But guess what? Everybody's life is complicated and messy. Do you agree? Yeah. Mine is. Is yours? Yeah, they are. That's part of the life experience. So that's not what makes a good life. Every life has love 
and pain and happiness and sorrow and good and bad and turmoil and chaos and perfection and getting up and falling down. And all of that, that's part of the life experience. It's what we do with that that makes a difference. And here's, he's, um, the author said, even when it's good, it's not easy. Because we have to create and be part. Yeah, the goodness is chasing after us. What do we need to do? Stop and embrace it and let it happen. It's there, but we have to do our part. So every single life that's here and everywhere, we have to do our part to make our life good. A good life doesn't just happen. It unfolds with time as we learn to take our experiences and mold them and forge them into something that makes sense and have meaning, and that's good. And what this study came up with is there's one unifying factor, one thing they found that makes a good life. It's the tying connector that creates physical health, mental health, longevity, and happiness. And that's good relationships. And so if we made one choice in our life to make our life better, it's to cultivate and nurture warm, warm relationships. And then I'm adding with God, ourselves, and others, where we nurture those relationships. We make them better. We have to show up. Good relationships don't just happen. They have to be taken care of. So let's start with our relationship with God. I have a quote by Ralph Waldo Emerson that I keep in my pocket. I keep it there because I want to pull it out as a reminder all the time of what to do. He said, hitch your wagon to a star. Take your life and always connect it to something bigger. But you see, if we're going to do that, we've got to reach up. We've got to be part of that. Hitch your wagon to a star. Ernest Holmes said, there's a power for good in the universe, and you can use it. We have to use it. It's there all the time. There's never a time it's not there. We have to use it and claim it. And, you know, if, well, first of all, in, in spiritual traditions, uh, I think every spiritual tradition almost has a tree of life that's a symbol of our connection with heaven and earth and our connection to a higher power. And it's just that, you know, growing, evolving, becoming, having roots in the ground. However, the Kabbalah, the ancient Jewish mysticism, has a different picture of the tree. Their tree is inverted. So their roots are in heaven. And they're growing and becoming and expanding and learning on the earth. I like that tree. Everything changes if you put God first. Everything changes. Our whole attitude in life changes when our faith becomes more dominant than our fear. Then our love becomes more dominant than our anger or our upset. We can do it. You know, I was reading, you know, we've got, we think our, we know our world is a mess. But as Joseph Campbell said, it's always been a mess. The world is always a mess. You know, we just have it in our face a little bit more. But during World War II, um, this is a, a book that Ernest wrote, and I have the hard copy and the paperback. But he wrote this book called This Thing Called Life. And life is spelled with a capital L all through the book, and he equates life to God. He, they're synonymous. And during World War II, Ernest and Hazel Holmes along with their continued prayer treatment, along with continuous prayer treatment, they donated 45,000 books to the armed services. They took it to them. I mean, they, they did that again in the Korean War, too, but they donated books because they knew if you put your faith first, everything makes more sense. And they got, um, Ernest Holmes got a letter from one of the soldiers that said, in our troop, troops, we only had two, this thing called life, books. And we all wanted to read it. 
So we tore out the pages of both books and taped them on the walls so we could read the book in our off duty. And he said, it changed our lives. So my message there is we've got to do our work every day to make that warm connection with spirit, to create that relationship that we can, because God, whatever if you call it, God, spirit, creative intelligence, universal power, it doesn't matter what name you call it, but it's that oh, all-encompassing presence of good. And if we create a day, a time, times every day, to feel the presence, because we can't intellectualize it, we can't rationalize it. It's something we have to feel, accept, claim, and know. And if we put that first, life changes. So then we do that, number one. And then number two, we get to work on ourselves. That's the second thing we get to do. And here's another thing that uh, Ernest Holmes said, the only real sin, now we don't feel a sin as, an, as anything but making a big mistake. The only sin is to limit yourself because you do not think you're worthy. If everybody and everything is made in the image and likeness of God, everything, how could any one of us not be worthy? We're all worthy. And the power for something, the power of something greater that Ernest Holmes talks about it is available to everyone all the time, everywhere, anywhere. It's there. We have to claim it. And you may sink down sometimes in your upset and your unhappiness and not feeling good enough. You may sink down, but let me tell you, there's a buoy inside each one of us. It's called the divine urge. It's that urge in us that doesn't want us to sink, that doesn't want us to fail, that doesn't want us to fall. We have to tap into that so we can rise up to something greater. Before we left, um, the, the world, uh, world Gymnastic Championships were on. And I love watching Simone Biles in the gymnastics. And she won that championship. But I want to tell you what she said. Her words, along with the one pocket I have uh, Emerson's words, hitch your wagon to a star, and the other one I have Simone Biles. Because this is, what, well, it wasn't what she said, it's what a commentator said. She went back to the world championship after two years off. It was unprecedented for a top-notch gymnast to take a two-year break. And she said she had to do so because she had to focus on her mental health and she didn't want to jeopardize in any way her health and well-being. She put herself first because she knew if she continued the way she was feeling and not dealing with the problems that had all of a sudden come to light in her life, she wasn't going to be any good anymore. So she took the time off and, he, and then she's returned with an undefeated comeback. But at the World Championships, in her last competition, she had minor mistakes on the un uneven bars. She lost her balance on the balance beam. And late in her floor exercise, she tripped. She tripped. But one of the commentators said, the reason Simone Biles is the most decorated gymnast of all time and won this gold medal for the all-around Olympic um, gymnast is because she doesn't react. She adjusts. She adjusts her life. So when there's a problem, when you fall down, when something happens, instead of getting all, she reacted. She, she had said when she had this floor exercise and I saw it and she tripped, she kind of went, oops, oops. Instead of going, oh my God, I messed everything up. This is all wrong. And she could get herself back on track. So I want to just take that as a, just a suggestion for us. First of all, hit your wagon to a star. But then, when the world, which it does, things happen. You know, well, that's about relationships. But things happen, and we get hurt, and we get upset, and we get angry, and we don't know the whole story. We don't know the whole thing, but we react instead of, adjusting our minds, our thoughts, and thinking, what else could be true? What is it I don't know? What do I need to know? We can adjust ourselves. And then we get to each other. How do you create a family? How do you create people that care for each other? Well, the power of good, 
that's always chasing us is about unconditional love and forgiveness. Those seem pretty tough. In fact, they seem really tough a lot of times because all of us make mistakes. We do, we do unkind things unknowingly. We hurt people we love. People we love hurt us, and it happens. And how do we, how do we take care of each other? What do we do? There's just two words that I can think of. Be kind to yourself and one another. When we start being kind and keeping unconditional love and forgiveness at the forefront of our mind, we can do two things. We can take the right action, which means it's right for all involved. We can take the right action and we can, um, I wrote something else, oh, Oh, I haven't turned the page yet, so that's fine. I don't know. We can do something else that's really good, too, but I can't remember. Um, so I just want to close with a quote by Ernest Holmes. I like this one. It's a good reminder. So if any of us came in here kind of stuck, holding on to some things, he said, life is like the sun. It shines on everyone and everything. Always, continually. God never blinks, remember. Get out of the shadows. Open the windows of your, uh, of your mind and the doors of your soul. Open up. Let it in. It's running after you. He said, lift up your thought and let life be to you whatever you wish it to be. Let it be that because it wants to be. It's there. It wants to let you have the life you desire. Learn to resurrect yourself. My boyfriend Rumi from the 13th century says it a little bit differently. <laughs> he says, don't just open the window. Tear down the wall. Tear it down. Stop pushing the goodness away. You know, as he also said, life is a guest house. You'll get a ton of emotions on a daily basis. And let them all in because they're all messages from the divine. So today, I want us all to um, see beyond our appearances and know there's something more going on. Hitch your wagon to a star. And right here and right now, with what's ever going on in your life, just say, I love my life. I love my life. In, all in all its expressions. I love God or whatever your name you call it. I love myself. I love myself. And I love all of you. And I love all of you. Right here, right, here. Right, now. right now, and always. And, always. and, so, it and so it is. God bless you all. I'm so glad you're here. Love you all. Take care.